Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Now, this I didn't post last week um, for what I would like to think of being obvious reasons, and I have taken a lot of time to listen, to learn, and to educate myself on the whole Black Lives Matter movement, and I thought today would be another great opportunity to learn and to listen to one of my dearest friends from, we've known each other for so long, uh, Yona Knight Wisdom, who is one of a handful of black divers that are competing today. And I have never taken the time to ask him about his experiences as a black athlete and how they may have differed to how I grew up as an athlete. So. I'm going to be speaking to him on Zoom today to just get a little bit of an insight and to just listen and learn. And uh, with everything that's been going on, I think it's the, the best thing that we can do is to ask questions, try to understand and amplify black voices and how to be a better ally. Like I want to know how I can support and how I can help and how I can use my platform to create change. So don't know exactly what the content of this conversation is going to be, but we're going to have a chat and see what comes of it. Hello, Yona. Hey, Tom. How's it going? Yeah, no, it's going good. I mean, it's kind of been crazy this last, you know, what, 10 weeks are we now in lockdown, right? Hasn't it been yeah. nuts? Yeah, it's been insane, insane. How long have we known each other now? Since back when, what, eight, nine? When we were nine? When you might have been... I think it was 2005 I first met you. I started down in 2004. Wow. 2005 was when I first met you. So like 15 years ago. I think there was one from like the World Series or something. Uh, one of the first ones in Sheffield. Oh, probably that's 2007 maybe. Yeah, somewhere around there. I think that's, that's probably cool. the first picture that we have. Yeah. Uh, we look very different now. No, I, I, I know. It's so funny because I remember when you first started diving, you were so little and then all of a sudden you've become like you're so you're so tall for a diver, it's kind of insane. The reason for doing this right now is um, with everything that's been going on over the last few weeks uh, with the murder, you could say, of George Floyd, um, I have been taking the time to really try and understand, I know that I'll never understand um, yeah. from what it's like to grow up as a black person because that's not who I am. But I wanted to take the time to listen learn, understand, and try and educate myself because some of the things that I've learned over these past few weeks has literally blown my mind. I don't know what your experience has been, but I wanted to know how it, your experience as a black athlete has been from the get-go, if you've experienced any kind of prejudice, any kind of racial bias or anything like that, that you can think of. It's, it's, really, it's really hard to tell, um, you know, from, from my perspective, when I was growing up, I always thought as racism or racial prejudice, discrimination, all those kind of, kind of things as something that will put me down and inhibit my ability to, you know, become the best diver that I could possibly be. And, you know, there, there were a number of obstacles and disadvantages that I had. Um, one of them obviously being my height, which was a real challenge. But I, I never considered my race to, to be a disadvantage that you know affected my progress you know at the time when I was a little bit younger there was a lot of competition I had a very difficult age group you know there, there were many reasons why I never broke through for Great Britain so I had to take the step away to represent Jamaica um, to try and achieve what I wanted to but you know I, I never felt like it was any kind of racial discrimination but then you know it depends on how you I guess define the term because I, I don't know. I think a lot of, I think a lot of racism is actually subconscious. So there could have been times where, based on the fact that I stood out so much compared to all the other divers, you know, judges might have looked upon me differently. Selectors might have looked upon me differently. Other athletes, coaches, they might have looked upon me differently, subconsciously. Yeah. Did that affect me? I guess not, because you know I've still managed to achieve so many great things in diving and it's not been an easy journey but you know when I was younger I wasn't a very good diver well I wasn't I was an okay diver but I've definitely improved a lot due to the work that I put in myself yeah absolutely year. I mean I, I can remember when you made that decision to represent Jamaica and at the time everyone was like oh my gosh that's amazing we're gonna have 
another British person go to compete and under a different flag. But, you know, we've been on World Class Start program and diving competitions together since, I mean, sort of goes way back. We were like one of some of the first like talent ID things. And it's been so amazing to actually watch how the opportunities that you've been able to go and compete and compete regularly, like now, the, those com competitions have enabled you to grow into such an amazing diver and now probably would qualify for GB as well. So it's been like yeah. a, a real journey, right? No, it has, it has been a crazy journey. And I look back on, you know, some of the things I've achieved whilst representing Jamaica and it's actually phenomenal how it's worked out. Um, you know, I sat down with, with my coach at the time, Edwin, and we made a plan of what we wanted to achieve. Um, you know, we were there in 2012 and we were looking towards 2016. Like, that's the goal. How are we going to go achieve that? And, you know, we managed to execute the plan pretty much perfectly. Um, but, yeah, be before that time, it was, it was very bumpy. I mean, there were so many highs and lows, um, so many near misses in terms of making teams, a lot of you know, myself questioning whether diving was a sport for me, whether I had a future. And I'm so glad that that opportunity came so I was able to continue pushing on in the sport. And have you ever, um, you know, experienced things that have kind of made you feel slightly uncomfortable as a sense? Because, again, I, I never know... I mean, I'm putting myself in an uncomfortable situation because I want to know more. And, you know, you see sometimes you have to ask things that are slightly uncomfortable. But have you ever been made to feel uncomfortable, um, you know, not wanted in a situation when it comes to sport or even outside of sport? Like, I'm, I mean, I can imagine you have, but I was just curious if within the sport you had. Yeah, I think, I think the easy answer to that is definitely yes. Like, there's been so many situations where I've, I've felt uncomfortable and, you know, it's been various... Um, various circumstances, you know, whether it's around my friends, whether it's in, um, I guess, a more professional situation. And I think, especially amongst friends, you know, I'd, my friends have helped to shape who I am today. And, you know, I appreciate all of them. They've, they've all been great to me. Um, but I think there's, there's a word called banter, which mm. has definitely been... I think misshapen, you know, banter is lighthearted, I guess, comedy at the expense of someone else. But what that can definitely easily transition into is hurtful and, um, you know, discriminatory things uh, mm -hmm. said for a joke, but it's not really a joke, but then it's kind of passed off as banter, do you know what I mean? And it's one um, of those things that you can't, I guess you, you have that banter and you but at the same time it's like where does that banter come from why is it funny to say those things because in reality nothing that has happened like all the things that i've learned over the past few weeks where I've, the things i've been reading what things i've been listening to things i've been watching like none of that is funny in yeah. any way shape or form and the seeing like the systemic racism and all of that kind of stuff that i've learned so much about is just it really has blown my mind I don't know if there's anything in particular that you've learned over this period of time as well I mean I think I've learned that it goes a lot deeper than I initially thought it was um, in terms of the idea of systemic racism um, and particularly in America uh, the idea that you know black families can only buy houses in certain areas where those houses weren't going to make as much money as um, white families and then mm -hmm. You know, because of their location, they can only go to certain schools and then that affects their future prospects. So they don't get the same education as the white family does just because they're in a slightly different area. And the border could be right here. They could be almost living next to each other. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, that has been done specifically to, I guess, hold back black people and promote white people. And it's, I think that's the type of thing that I've learned and it's made me think about my past experiences in a different way to the way that I originally thought about it. I mean, especially with, with banter, as we, as we were talking about, um, I will have brushed a lot of things off um, at the time, you know, just seeing it as a joke and it doesn't really affect me. But, you know, some of the, some of the things are unacceptable and I'm sure that you can probably relate as well with, with homophobia and the pride movement. I think 
those two things that they're very similar to this situation like we're seeing racism now brought to a front and we're seeing this black lives movement now um trying to combat that issue and i think it's the exact same situation as, as homophobia and um and the pride movement yeah, I think it's very much, it is very similar. And, you know, at the end of the day, that as, as a minority, uh, minorities have to come together um, to help support one another. Like the whole gay liberation movement was started by people of color um, from all different, like trans people. Like, and so there's all of these, there's so many different people, different minorities that have to come together and build bridges to be able to form a coalition of yeah. all of the minorities, all of the outsiders to come together to be really strong as allies, which is kind of why, you know, but at the end of the day, I'm a, you know, a white male, uh, cisgender. So, but, so it, in a way I've got it easy, even if I am a, a gay man, like I, it's, it's how can we, or myself, how can we be better allies uh, to help with the black movement. And I don't know if you have any ideas, but you know, it's, but for me, what I've been trying to do is to try to amplify black voices and listen, learn, and just try and take in as much as possible so I can, you know, help build the, you know, anti-racism movement. Yeah, you said the word allies, and I think that's really important. Like it's gotta be a united front. It can't, it can't just be black people. I mean, um, Terry, I think Terry Crews made a, a tweet the other day which he, he got a lot of stick for. Um, and I think probably the delivery of his tweet was wrong, um, which was the reason why he got a lot of stick for it. But I think it can't just be black people alone making this movement against white people because that's not what the main issue is. It goes a lot deeper than that, as you said. And it's not just black versus white. It's a, it's a matter of society and culture. Um, and I think that's where the change needs to happen. Unfortunately, I think black people have been at the bottom of society generally for too long now. And there are reasons behind why that's a thing. So, you know, things like poverty and, um, as we've said, systemic racism based on where people live and the opportunities that they have um, to them, that's all the cause of that. And yeah. it's like a big cycle that just never stops unless something is put into it which ends it and um, allows us to all move forward together as a yeah. big group and have you ever like felt differently when you're say for example if you're going away to a diving competition and you're in the uk do you ever feel differently whether that's safety wise whether that's what worrying about what people are going to say or do if you were to go to another country like for example you've been to uh, have you, you've competed in China, right? In Wuhan is when you competed, yeah. right? So did you, because I know that our physio, Gareth, experiences a lot of looks and remarks. Like, have you, what was your experience of going uh, to somewhere like China, for example? Um, in, in China specifically, they, they, they don't see many other people, um, many other races, many other colours. Um, you know, in, in that part of the world, they'll even get excited about you know, a girl who has blonde hair, for example. Like because, Tonya. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's kind of rare. So in terms of China, I didn't, I didn't feel negative about, you know, the way that people looked upon me just mm. because I was aware of what that, that part of the world is like. The, the, the place where I was probably most concerned was actually Russia. Oh, really? And, you know, my, in the, in the end of it, my concern didn't actually match my experience there. I actually had a really great time. Um, we were in Kazan at the World Champs in 2015. And, you know, I think it might have been a, a couple of months before we went out there. I watched a Reggie Yates documentary of when he went to Russia. And I think it's been made clear in, in many different aspects that there's a lot of racism in Russia. Um, you know, football is one place to look at because... I think that there have been not many black players to play in the Russian Football League and a lot of them ex have experienced a lot of racism from the fans. Mm. So, you know, seeing those kind of things, it made me feel a little bit concerned when I went to Russia and it was so bizarre. Maybe I had the thought in my head already, but when I landed in Moscow um, before making my connection to Kazan, I just felt like people were looking at me and I just felt like I had eyes on me which made me feel really, really uneasy. 
I can imagine. And, you know, it was in that airport um, setting where, you know, you, you're pretty much locked in. You're just in that one place. So once I got out of that, once I got to Kazan, you know, I went out into the city. Um, I didn't feel uncomfortable out there. That was, that was really nice. But there was that small period of time where I felt really uncomfortable. And, you know, as I say, at the time, I didn't really think too much about it. You know, it didn't really bother me. But thinking about it, that was probably because of the colour of my skin and that makes me feel a bit, you know, it doesn't make me feel great. Yeah, I mean, it's something that it's, it makes, it baffles me to even have to, like, think about it. Like, I mean, my experience in Russia has been, was, you know, as a gay person, to go to Russia, you hear about all the people getting killed, getting beaten, getting thrown in jail for being, for being gay. But the, but the difference is, is that I'm walking around with a team, there's not going to be a Russian person that's going to be like, oh, that's the gay one and yeah. it's it's a completely different experience and so it's just interesting to hear that and i mean i know you, what you mean about that in china i mean people if they have blocked i guess the big thing that i'm learning is that people are afraid of something that's different yeah. to them they're afraid of something and you know if you don't understand something and something's different to you and they don't think that the same way or they don't you know they have different ways of doing things whatever it may be it's if somebody is different to you if you take the time to under, try to understand and try to learn about them you don't have to be scared or be worried or like be fearful of them because you can start to understand the way that they think and i think that's a big part of it is that people are afraid of what's different to them yeah and and i think the understanding is something that a lot of people aren't willing to do with this situation in particular. I don't know why, but I feel a lot of people are actually almost scared of trying to understand, you know, what it is really like to be black, especially in the UK or in America where we are a minority. Mm. And not just that, but the history of, um, of our people over here. I mean, my situation is very different. My, my parents, came from Jamaica and Barbados. So, you know, I don't have, from what I know, I don't have that like link to slavery in the UK or the US, but um, you see the statues that are being torn down, um, which is vandalism, yes. Um, but, you know, th those people, they're being celebrated for making a lot of money through slavery, which was a really, really bad, bad time. And I was I've seen a lot of debate about whether the statue should be torn down or whether it should be left up to maintain the history. Um, you know, I, I understand kind of both sides. Um, but at the end of the day, what those people did to make the money, no matter how they donated it and, and what they built with it, how they made the money in the first place was wrong. Absolutely. I, I, I agree. Like, I think, you know, if anybody does anything that is like that and they're celebrated for it, like regardless, you know, uh, lots of people will argue that, oh, yeah, but back then it was different the way that they think and what was acceptable or not. But actually, you know, that stuff was never OK. That yeah. stuff was always controversial. I know what you're saying, but at the same time, it's like they did horrible things. So how, how do you how do you feel kind of watching the protests and everything going on? looking kind of from, I guess, the outside in, um, seeing all that, how does it make you feel? I mean, it, like, to be honest, the first, especially the first few days after seeing the George Floyd video and all of that kind of stuff, it, it, made, it made me feel extremely angry. It made me feel very upset and it made me feel quite helpless. And I think a lot from my experience as a white person, I feel like I've always never quite wanted to step into the racial debate because I always feel like we don't know if I'm going to say the right thing. I don't want to offend anyone and I don't want to put my foot in it. And to be honest, that for me, that moment, I think was a massive turning point for so many people where it was like, you know what, I've had enough of this crap where that people think they can just get away with it. And, you know, being able to, and I think that's where I really do think that I, where everyone has come the way that everyone has come together has been really powerful i mean i know certain things have happened but at the end of the day still things have not changed and so th people still need to be out there making their voices heard and trying to do whatever like and that's where it's like do whatever we can to try and you know help and it's hard to know what's right to say what's right to do but 
all we can do is try and do our best, right? Do you know what, funnily enough, I, the, the turning point that you spoke about, I feel like it was a similar kind of turning point for me because even as a, as a black person, I've not wanted to get into the racial debate either. You know, you see it in football, Raheem Sterling is the prime example. Like he has been very outspoken about race um, divisions in, in football as a sport. And I've really been, not trying to avoid it, but I've not been as willing to get involved in that because I didn't want to be seen as, you know, just jumping on the bandwagon. Um, I didn't want to, you know, play the victim when it's not really actually affecting me. Mm. Um, but that's not what it is at the end of the day. You know, whether it affects you or not, there's things that you can do as a person to help those that are in need. And thinking about this situation, there's a lot of parts of life that I have ignored to a certain extent because it makes me feel uncomfortable to think about it as a reality. For example, someone I spoke to, you know, mentioned, um, you know, gangs and, um, you know, that kind of world that we never see. And, you know, thinking about the actual reasons behind it, it's, mm. it's really horrible. It's really horrible. And there's things that we can do um, in our, we are privileged. We are very privileged in our privileged position. There are things that we can do to help those people that need help to bring everyone else up. And it's Absolutely. got to come from the people at the top, the people of privilege, to do what they can to help bring the other people up, um, whether they're black, white, you know, there's various people that are in positions um, of, of difficulty in life, and it's not always down to race. We can do it. Absolutely. There's, there's, there, I mean, you know, there's thousands of problems in the world, but the fact that this should not be one of them is kind of the, the long and short of it. And if we do have a platform, um, you know, not speaking out is you're taking the side of, you know, the oppressor, if you like, and that's not, that's not okay, which is, you know, why I've been trying to do what I can. Um, and I think yeah. so many people are, and it's really quite amazing to see. And I think if whatever we can and uh, however we can to use our voices to try and lift that up and then also to be able to donate, if we're able to donate to those causes as well, can really help, um, bring the movement along but I want like but it's you know it's yeah it's it's been it's been a, a real wake-up call it makes you really look in on yourself and think what could I have done better how can I be better um it's been yeah it's been a real wake-up call yeah and and as I say that's not just related to race I think it's mm. just general life as exactly. I mentioned earlier with homophobia like it's the same thing for that and other disc discriminations that we see in life, it's the same thing. You got to look at yourself and think, what can I do better? And how can I be better? And how can I help? And I think the three main ways that anyone can help is to donate, to educate, and to conversate. And I don't know if conversate is a real word, but it kind of flows. If you can donate to, to organizations, I think that, that that can actually take action on improving things, then do that. If you can't, then educate yourself or help to educate others based on your own experiences, based on the experiences of others. There's so many Netflix documentaries. There is Google, which is, it's got all the answers. So you can educate yourself on that. And, you know, have conversations with people, like these difficult conversations. At, you know, two months ago, there is no way that me and you would be having this conversation. No, no, exactly. Like, I've never even, thought to ask you about your you know how it has been as a blackout like i'd never would never even cross my mind for one but two like I, you just don't realize what you know what you've gone what you've gone through what you continue to go through and so it's it's just really interesting to hear it exactly. from you, and, you know and the thing is like why would you because you know you've got your own things to deal with you know where you, you before coronavirus you had the 2020 olympics to prepare for you know everything you, you have all of that and same thing with everyone else they have their daily lives to worry about and it's funny that this whole situation in this time of coronavirus and lockdown where no one really has a normal life to go back to so that, that means i think the reason why so much pressure has stayed on this on this subject because it's just been in our faces we don't have normal sport or normal life work to go back to 
So I, I think that's actually been weirdly helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just want to say thank you for chatting with me about all of that because it's just been so interesting to hear all of that. And hopefully we'll be back in the diving pool soon and, you know, at the competitions, at the training camps and getting ready for Tokyo 2021, I guess. Seriously, I, I want to say thank you to you too because, you know, I've spoken about kind of giving my platform to, to help raise, raise awareness of it, but, you know, it makes sense to me more than, it, more than it makes sense for you. But the fact that you've kind of taken that big step to have these difficult conversations, that's, um, that's really awesome and admirable. So thank you very much to you. And as I say, yeah, as you say, hopefully we can get back to training soon. Cause... Exactly. It's been, you know, it's again, for, for me, this is the, the least I could do. To, and it's not even about me or about that. It's about just trying to do whatever is possible to help make a change. So, but anyway, thank you for coming along and I will see you at the pool very soon. Thank you. Awesome. It's always so nice to get to speak to Yona, bless him. He's a great cracking guy. Uh, if you don't follow him on Instagram, you definitely should. He has an amazing podcast called Athletes Voice as well, where he talks to loads of athletes. And as he said, he's, you know, he's training hard and he's doing well and we're going to be back together competing soon. So, but anyway, thank you for watching this. Uh, it really means a lot. I mean, I, like I said, everyone's been taking more time to learn, to listen, to educate themselves. But thank you for watching and share this video with someone that you think might want to hear the perspective of uh, Yona uh, as a black diver training in the UK, commuting for Jamaica, one of the first Jamaican divers, or the first Jamaican diver. So it's got a pretty awesome story. But anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.